The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. I am The Whistler, and I know many things where I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the signal oil program, The Whistler. Remember, let every traffic signal remind you, with signal... New Signal Gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for Signal's big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story. Coincidence. Coincidence can kill a man and do it as effectively and brutally as a professional murder. Yes, coincidence can be a murder weapon, particularly when it falls into the hands of someone like Francia Legrand. It began shortly after her sister Elise had separated from her husband and moved to the Strathmore Apartments on the west side of Manhattan. And naturally, Francia didn't know at first that coincidence was working behind her. But it was there... One night when she returned from an errand. Did you go to the drugstore, Francia? Yes, here you are. But... But that isn't what I want. I'm sorry, Elise. It's the best I could do. They were out of the other kind. What are you writing? A letter. You can take your hand off it, dear. I won't look over your shoulder. Cigarette? No, thanks. You are wrought up, aren't you? Shall I sit down? If you like. I seem to be as welcome as the Black Plague. I'm sorry, Francie. Oh, don't apologize. I understand perfectly. You don't want to see anyone. Your husband is gone. Life isn't worth living. Please, Francie. Ross isn't coming back this time, Elise. I know he's gone. You don't have to tell me. You're afraid to face it, aren't you? Why don't you admit it? You've made a mess of your life, Elise. You had everything you wanted and you chucked it out the window. There's no one to blame but yourself. Francie, stop it. Why do you keep throwing it up to me over and over again? What difference does it make to you? It's my life. It's my marriage. That's where you're wrong. It's not yours anymore. What do you mean? It's my turn now, Elise. Your turn? I'm not going to make the same mistake you did. Why? You... You love him, don't you? Of course I love him. Well, take him. He's all yours. You don't have to tell me I've made a mess out of my life. I know it. I've always, I've always known it. But I couldn't do anything about it. Don't you see? I'm no good. You're right. Everything you've said to me over and over again is right. Now get out of here. Go on. Get out. Just a minute. I want you to know Ross had nothing to do with it. There's never been anything between us. I know. I know. I'm sorry, Francie. It's all my fault. And I admit it. Perhaps you can make him happy. He deserves it. I hope so. Now, please go. Annette? Annette? Yes, madame? Please get Miss Legrand's things. She's leaving. And, uh... Do you suppose that you could spend the night with your sister? But of course, madame, if you wish. I'd rather you would. Tonight, I... I'd like to be by myself. Well, Francia, she's defeated, isn't she? 
It's taken five years, five frustrated, maddening years. And now, at long last, you've accomplished what you set out to do. That's why you're elated as you go into a phone booth in the lobby downstairs. Hello, Ross. This is Francia. Ross, I've been up to see her. It's simply no use. I tried to patch it up. Well, I'd rather not discuss it over the phone. Suppose I pick you up at 79th and Madison in a half hour. Well, it's no use, Ross. She wouldn't listen. <laughs> It was at that moment, while you stood in the phone booth talking, that coincidence moved into the picture, Francia. First in a taxi cab, pulling up to the main entrance. Take the side entrance, driver. I can't park here, Chief. Don't argue with me. Pull around to the side entrance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Second, just one minute later in the elevator, not far from the booth where you're talking... Twelve four, mister. What do you mean, twelve? I told you ten. Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't thinking. Don't hand me that. Take me back to ten. I haven't got all night. Yes, sir. And third, at the entrance of apartment 1072, next door to your sister, Elise. <gasps> Joe! Hello, Marie. Are you crazy, Joe? What are you doing here? What's that detective doing at the main entrance? I don't know. You, uh, wouldn't turn me in, would you? <gasps> know any more now, Marie? No, Joe. Joe, listen. <laughs> Joe, please. You and I got some talking to do, honey. <gasps> yes, Francia, that's where coincidence moved in. When Joe Fortescue, gambler, fugitive from justice, walked down the corridor to apartment 1072, next door to your sister Elise, the machinery of coincidence was in full motion. But as you drive through the park, you have no way of knowing that now. All you can think of is Ross. Did you tell her what I said, Francia? Yes, she wouldn't listen. Maybe it's just as well. What did she say? It's all over, period. Just that? Just that. Oh, I knew it would never work out, Ross. She's not your kind of a girl. She never understood you. Maybe I expected too much. No, no, it wasn't that. It's hard to figure out what it was looking back at it now. Maybe it was those awful, ugly quarrels. You know, Francia, it almost seemed as if I were married to two different women. I know. Yeah, I guess you do. Ross... Now that it's all over, I want to tell you something. Yes? Those five years were difficult for me, too. Standing on the sidelines, seeing you married to someone you didn't love. What? Are you going to make me say it, Ross? Yes. Say it. I wanted to for so long, but I couldn't. She was always there between us. I... I do love you, Ross. What's the matter? How could you do it? What do you mean? The pieces all fit together now. It makes sense for a change. Ross. You were always there beside her, weren't you? The pal, the faithful sister. Oh, you're wrong. I didn't... Don't lie to me. I've got to hand it to you, Francia. You did a great job. Magnificent. Never made a slip. You don't understand. I'm afraid I do. She was two people, wasn't she? She was herself and she was what you made her with your vicious, insinuating remarks. I only hope I can put the pieces together again. Let me out. I have an important phone call to make. In the middle of the park? I don't care where we are. Pull over, will you? Oh, Ross, aren't you going to let me explain? You've explained enough. It wasn't only a stab in the back, sweetheart. It was an insult. I'd have to be pretty desperate before I'd fall in love with you. I could kill you. You could kill him, couldn't you, Francia? Five years of careful, deadly planning gone for nothing. It was an insult, he said. If he weren't so bitter, he would have laughed at you. You drive through the park thinking, 
It's all over, isn't it? You've driven them together this time, done them a favor. Elise would never believe you this time. Or would she? You decide to take a chance and turn your car toward the Strathmore Apartments again. Elise is probably still up, finishing her correspondence. This time, there's no other way, Ross, dear. Killing oneself is wrong, I know. I only hope you'll try to understand. Goodbye, darling. Elise. Yes, Francia, Elise has caught up on her correspondence. And now she stands at the window looking down into the street ten floors below. The telephone rings in the bedroom, but Elise pays no attention. She isn't even conscious of the argument between Joe and Marie in the apartment Joe, next door. I do ah, you ought to kill you, you lying little rat. Why don't you admit it? Oh, I wouldn't double cross you, Joe. Why should I? What good would <laughs> What's that? Christopher, look down there. <gasps> Somebody just fell out of a window. Signal. New Signal Gasoline. With the prologue of tonight's story, Coincidence, the Signal Oil Company brings you another of the strange tales by The Whistler. If you drive a car, this timely warning from the National Safety Council is for you. During one year, 97,800 persons were killed right here in America in accidents. Of the deaths caused by autos, one out of five occurred when roads were wet or slippery. One out of five when driver's vision was obscured. Fortunately, precautions can be taken to help prevent these two types of accidents. For instance, tires that are worn smooth tend to skid more readily. But a deep, heavy retread job, the kind signal gasoline dealers are prepared to give your tires, will restore their grip on the road, help you stop more quickly. And if a worn windshield wiper is leaving streaks across your vision, signal gasoline dealers will install a fine new Rainmaster blade while you wait. So have your tire tread and your windshield wiper checked the next time you're at your neighborhood signal gasoline dealers. You'll feel a lot better knowing your car is prepared for the wet weather driving ahead. And it may help save a life, possibly your own. And now, back to the whistler. Yes, Francia, coincidence can kill, particularly when there's someone to help it over the humps. The suicide of your sister Elise is the center of it, of course. And the other threads are beginning to weave together now. The thread Joe Fortescue contributed when he got out of the taxi at the side entrance of the Strathmore Apartments at 10.30 and went directly to room 1072 next door to Elise. The thread that put Ambrose Marks detective in the lobby at the same time. And most important of all, the thread that placed you and Ross together in your car at five minutes to 11 in the middle of Central Park. There's an excited crowd milling around the base of the apartment building as you arrive. Quiet, everybody. We haven't identified her yet. What's the matter? Some woman's hurt. Maybe killed here. Stand back. Away from the curb, everyone. That's a detective. She fell from a window up there. Uh, Let me through, please. Stand back, please. Please let me through. Who who is she? Who? We don't know. Now stand back, lady. Well, where's the body? Maybe I... Sorry, lady. Now please move on. But I tell you... Later, lady. All right, folks. The lady's dead. Let me through here, please. There's nothing we can do for her. Thank you. Let me through, please. Going up? Yes. What floor, ma'am? 
10, please. Right. Have they uh, found out who she is yet? No. <laughs> Great guy, Detective Marks. Ain't even figured out what floor she jumped from yet. Or was thrown from. What do you mean, thrown? I got my own ideas. A guy came up here a while ago who looked like he was ready to put the fix on somebody. All bundled up with a scarf over his face. You mean it was murder? What else? Oh, what was that floor again? Ten. Hmm. Funny. That's where he got off, too. Elise? Elise, are you in here? Medicine. That note she was writing. Ross, darling, I'm going to kill myself tonight, and I want you to know why. It's clear now that I can't live either with you or without you. It was Elise. Going down. Main floor? Yes. I was right, you know. About what? The guy in the tan coat. Wasn't I just talking to you? Oh, yes. You mean uh, the man who was angry? Yeah, the guy in the tan coat and the muffler. The dame on the ninth floor has really got the goods on him. Heard him and the girl fighting upstairs right over her apartment. Two minutes later, boom, she's on the pavement. Here you are. Main floor. Hey, just a minute. Going up. Ten, please. Oh, Hey, what's the matter? Where are you going? I'll be right back. Hello, uh, Ross. Oh, it's you. On your way up to get your nickels worth? I've been up. She isn't there. Well, I'll go up and wait. And by the way, you might as well go. I want to see her alone. Naturally. Any objections? No. Well, that's mighty decent of you. Say, what's the matter? Why are all these people in the lobby? And where did that boy go? He's over there with the police lieutenant. Police? Well, what are they doing here? There he is, chief, in my elevator. That's the guy. Are you sure? Positive. That's the guy in the tan coat. Well, Francia, that throws a new light on things, doesn't it? For the first time in your life, you have Ross where you want him. And you smile to yourself, thinking of the suicide note. Tucked away in your purse. You could clear him in a second, couldn't you, Francia? If you wanted to. But you'd rather watch him squirm, stammering answers to Detective Marks' sharp questions, trying to fight his way out of a tangled mass of circumstantial evidence piling up around him after you've both identified the body. All right, Mr. Mansfield. The taxi driver and the elevator boy have both identified you positively as the man in the tan coat who got off at the 10th floor shortly before your wife's death. The lady in the apartment downstairs says it was your voice she heard in the apartment overhead. Listen, Lieutenant, I tell you there's something wrong somewhere. Miss Legrand, isn't it true that Mr. and Mrs. Mansfield had several serious quarrels during the past month? Well, I... Oh, Ross, what will I say? I'm asking you, Miss Legrand. I'd rather not answer. Oh, you'd rather not answer. You know how that sounds, don't you? All right, it's true. We hadn't been getting along. But that has nothing to do with tonight. All right, Mansfield, we don't seem to be getting anywhere. I'll ask you to be available to the DA's office on 15 minutes' notice until the inquest is held. That clear? Very well, Mr. Marks. It's pleasant, isn't it, Francia? Ross is really squirming now, desperately trying to get out from under. You follow the papers carefully during the next few days, full of the man in the tan coat. Headlines screaming of Ross Mansfield, prominent architect, suspect in wife killing. The district attorney refusing to comment, stating an indictment should be forthcoming soon. And out of the welter of guessing, out of the quotes from informed sources, out of the analyses by crime experts, there comes one significant fact. The only thing that can save Ross Mansfield is an alibi. That puts it up to you, doesn't it, Francia? You have the power of life and death over him now. 
You can kill this man with a single statement. Hello, Ross. What are you doing here? It's rather important or I wouldn't have come. All right. Have you um, decided what you're going to say at the inquest tomorrow? Of course. There's nothing to worry about, Francia. All we have to do is tell the truth. Ross, do you still feel the same about me? How can you talk like that? Well, I'm only asking you. Skip it, will you? You don't have to jump at me. Francia, she was my wife. I loved her. She's dead. Does that mean anything to you? No, it doesn't, does it? It ought to, though. It ought to be on your conscience as long as you live. What are you talking about? They're right. She didn't kill herself. You murdered her. Just the same as if you'd shot her with a gun. That's where you're wrong. You killed her, Ross. Or, uh, haven't you read the papers? Well, don't say anything. I'm going. See you tomorrow at the inquest. <laughs> You decided then and there, didn't you, Francia? You're tired of watching him squirm now. You're going to put him out of his misery. It was murder, wasn't it, Francia? He's right. But murder doesn't bother you. You watch the flames creep slowly across the suicide note, the only other thing that could save him, and smile as you think of the inquest. Order, please, order. Lieutenant Marks, are you ready with your first witness? Yes, Mr. Coroner. Uh, I'd like to impress on the jury the fact that the testimony of this witness is perhaps more important than that of any other in this case. For that reason, I'm calling her first. Miss Legrand, will you take the stand, please? You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, Gun? I do. Sit down. Miss Legrand, what is your relation to the deceased? I'm her sister. Would you say that the marriage of Mr. and Mrs. Mansfield was a happy one? No. There were quarrels? Yes, lots of them. Have you any idea what caused them? I think so. What? Mr. Mansfield was rather fond of me. Francia, you know that's not true. Just a minute, Mr. Mansfield. Proceed, Lieutenant. Well, is it true, Miss Legrand? It is. He's in love with me. I see now, this is very important, Miss Legrand. Were you or were you not with Mr. Mansfield riding in your automobile in Central Park between the hours of 10.45 and 11.05 on the night of your sister's death? I was not. You realize you're under oath. I do. You realize the consequences of this testimony. Yes, I do. I didn't see him all evening. I swear I didn't. Is that enough? Yes, Miss Legrand. That's enough. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, because Americans are curious people, like to know what makes things tick, I want to explain just what it is that gives new signal gasoline its amazing power and performance. You see, science has long known that the way the atoms in gasoline molecules are arranged determines how much power you get from the gasoline. Well, in old-style gasolines, the atoms were left just as nature arranged them. But recently, certain chemists actually found out how to rearrange the atoms to give amazing new performance to new signal gasoline, which explains why new signal isn't just pre-war quality gasoline, not just old-style gasoline improved, but an entirely new type super fuel packed with thrilling power. For the fun of feeling your car get young again, make this test, won't you? Try just one tankful of new signal gasoline. Feel its quicker starting. See its faster pickup. Hear the smooth purr of your motor, thanks to signal's high anti-knock. And check your speedometer for proof that with new signal, you do go farther than ever. And then you be the judge. See if you don't agree that new signal actually is the new post-war gasoline you can prove is superior. And now, back to the Whistler. <laughs> yes, 
Yes, Francia, coincidence can kill a man, particularly if mixed up in it somewhere, there's a mind full of hatred to fill in the gaps. The case is complete, even though the inquest is hardly underway. They were right, Francia. Everything depended on your testimony on the alibi. Uh, just a minute, Miss Legrand. I'm not finished. If you weren't with Mansfield, where were you? I was out for a drive. Alone? Yes. Anyone see you? No. That's a pretty weak alibi. Alibi? See here, I'm not under suspicion. That's where you're wrong. Exhibit A, please. Recognize this? What? A box of poison, Miss Legrand, purchased by you on the night of the murder. Poison? Some people call it a sedative, but it's powerful enough to kill when taken in quantity. And it was taken in quantity. Enough of this drug was found in your sister's stomach to support this officer's contention that she was dead or nearly so before the fall. I didn't buy it. But you did buy it. I intend to call the druggist to the stand to prove it. She she sent me for it. I never saw it after I brought it to her. Then how does it happen that your fingerprints are on the metal box? Why, the box was on the note. Yes, that's it. She used the box for a paperweight to hold the note down. What note? The suicide note. I burned it. Oh, there was a suicide note and you burned it. Why? I... I don't know. I see. You're asking the jury to believe that your sister committed suicide and that you deliberately went out of your way to incriminate yourself. I had no reason to kill her. You just testified you had every reason to kill her. You're in love with Mansfield. You implied as much not one minute ago. You hated your sister, didn't you? I didn't hate her. We got along beautifully. And I'm prepared to put your sister's maid on the stand to testify that you had a crucial quarrel with Mrs. Mansfield over her husband less than an hour before she was murdered. She wasn't murdered. She... What about the man in the tan coat? His name is Joe Fortescue. He's been in custody for two days. Wait a minute. You're wrong. You can't go ahead with this. You're accusing me of murder. Right. Murder in the first degree. Premeditated. Willful. Oh, you can't. They, they, they'll send me... Oh, no, listen. Lieutenant, you've got to believe me. That's Please, just what me. we're doing. We're believing you. We believe you when you say your relationship with Mansfield was not exactly platonic. I know. We believe you when you swear you weren't with him at the time of the murder. Oh, but I lied. Ross, tell them I lied. I couldn't have killed her. I was with you. Wasn't I, Ross? Wasn't I with you? <laughs> You have anything to say, Mansfield? <laughs> Lieutenant, I... Well? All right, Lieutenant. I was with her. There. There, you see, that proves it. I couldn't have killed her. It does prove something. What do you mean? It proves he loves you. As far as the murder goes, you're going to have to convince a jury. And believe me, it's going to take a lot of convincing. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. is your signal for the signal oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular signal oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.